Welcome to Lancashire Innovation Festival Week 3. Um, Lancashire Innovation Festival is an opportunity to showcase all the fantastic innovation work that goes on throughout the county. During the month of October, we have a wide range of talks, seminars, workshops, networking sessions and panel discussions for everyone to join in with. You can find out more at lancashireinnovationfestival.co.uk. Thanks for tuning into this conversation today. Um, please feel free if you're attending to use the chat box to discuss, uh, tell us where you're from, talk to us about innovation, tell us all about the projects that you might be working on at the moment. Um, please also use the box marked Q&A to fire your questions to the audience, to, to the uh, panel, and our chair will manage those questions as we go throughout. Make sure as well that when you do use the chat box, you make sure it's selected to panelists and all attendees so everybody can see the conversation. You can also follow the chat uh, on Twitter using the hashtag LANIF2020 to keep up to date with everything that's going on. Uh, so this morning, without any further ado, I'm now going to hand you over to Ben Holiday from FutureGov, who will be chairing our conversation around innovation in the public sector. Over to you, Ben. Brilliant. Thank you, Dan. Uh, good morning, everybody. Fantastic to be here. Uh, so just to briefly introduce myself and then I'll, I'll interview uh, I'll introduce the, the people joining us this morning as part of our panel. Uh, so I'm the Chief Design Officer at FutureGov. So we're an agency that supports change across the public sector. Uh, we work with local government, central government and health organisations, as well as uh, with local communities and the voluntary and charity sectors. So we're very much a team made up of specialists in areas like design, research, data and insight and technology. And really, our focus is always about kind of this belief that public institutions can be the catalyst for change. So playing a really vital role in how we radically improve outcomes for communities, for citizens in the 21st century, uh, how we respond to some of the unique challenges that we're facing uh, as, as a public sector at the moment as well. Um, Probably the thing that I'm looking forward to discussing this morning when we think about innovation uh, is really, and this is our focus at FutureGov, that really recognising that most organisations, especially in the public sector, haven't really been designed for the internet or the digital era, and they certainly weren't designed for things like a climate emergency or for dealing with pandemics. And really, like a lot of our work is about helping organisations change how they work and thinking through the role they play in the places that they're part of. Um, and that's all really about improving how services are delivered. Uh, I'm joining you. I'm actually based in Kendall in Cumbria. So I'm just over the border today. So a few miles away from Lancashire. Uh, and I'm really glad to be joined as well. So I've got Victoria Irving with me and Steve Simpson. So uh, if I could ask, um, I'm going to ask them both to introduce themselves. I think really to start with, um, so Victoria, maybe if we could start with you. Um, if you could introduce yourself, but I'd be really, it'd be fantastic to hear like, what does innovation mean to you when you think about public sector innovation as well? So I'll hand over to Victoria to start with. Hi, yes, I'm Victoria Irving. I work in the core business systems in Lancashire County Council. Uh, innovation to me is, um, from a local authority perspective, is around making sure that people have not only the right um, technology and tools, but that there is a blend of bringing together um, the processes, the engagement, the people engagement more than anything. Um, and I think when we talk about innovation, people get very hung up on what the technology is. We utilize the technology, obviously, but we need to think about more innovative ways of engaging with people. Okay. Take myself off mute. Thanks, Victoria. Uh, Steve, do you want to introduce yourself and like, what does innovation mean to you in your role as well? Morning, everyone. Um, my name's Steve Simpson. I'm head of IT for both Lancaster City Council and Wire Council. And I think innovation for, for me and innovation in the, the, the public sector is is about not accepting the, the norm, not accepting the, the, the way we've always done things and constantly looking at how we can reevaluate, how we can do things differently. And as Victoria says, it's not just technology. It's about our own mindset and things. It's if we accept that the, this is the, the norm, we're never going to progress. We're never going to get better. We're never going to do things differently. And for me, it's got to be that constant journey of, of improvement, challenge, 
and looking at what what and how we can involve people or bring other people to the table. Fantastic. Thank you, Steve. Like really interesting themes already about kind of not kind of not just about technology. Like I think for me, quite often I see innovation kind of being talked about and actually it it doesn't really go beyond kind of the, the early digitization of services. So just putting things on the internet, but not really thinking about what it means to be um, kind of digital enabling kind of completely different models of how organizations work, especially in the public sector. Um, and I always quite like this kind of idea that innovation isn't really necessarily about making something completely new. It's really changing the order of how things work. Uh, how people work together so really really interesting to explore that just just to pause briefly so as Dan said right at the beginning like we're really happy so we've got about 45 minutes together today it'd be fantastic I think we've got about 24 people on the call at the moment if you've got questions please do let us know and put them in the Q&A panel we'll be really happy to take some of those so I guess to kick the conversation off a bit more um, so to go back to you both like how do you think that but the public sector can innovate in Lancashire. So obviously um, we, we've got representatives of two councils today, but maybe Steve, if I go back to you, like from, from your view from Lancaster and, and Wyatt, how do you think the public sector can play a role in Lancashire to, to support innovation? I think what, one of the, the big things for, for me, and it's uh, coming entirely from the, the private sector where there, the the mentality and it's a, a manufacturing environment I've come from. So you you're constantly challenging, you're constantly provoking um, ideas, and I think that's that's one of the the big areas coming into the the public sector where you you actually look at it, and it's it is very much very silo driven. It's very much council doing this, this council doing that, different council doing the other. You're all doing similar services you're all providing very similar things so let's get together let's look at how we can do things differently and whether it is process whether it's procedure whether it is technology that you you're creating that holistic view of of tech and and people um and i think public sector is is one of those where you've almost got a, a it's a it's a perfect environment to to innovate in because you're there, you've got a very captive market with the, the residents and the, the businesses. And you, you can very easily go and say, what do you want? How, what do you want us to do differently? How do you think it works now? And you can instantly get that feedback, sometimes good, sometimes not so good. And it's, it's constantly listening that we've, we've got to do. And I think that's probably, it's, whilst it's not strictly innovation, listening to people it it certainly is something that helps drive that innovative streak within people within teams and within organizations okay i'll uh, i'll just add to that really in terms of what what steve said there about the listening it's absolutely key that we start off with people um there's a lot of um, overuse of the phrase technology first or digital first in fact really technology and digital should come last it should be about people first uh, looking at solutions looking at um, <clears throat> how we can change the lives of and, and improve the lives of our citizens i think innovation um in in most local authorities at the moment or up until now certainly has happened by default and in terms of the innovation journey i think it's quite in its infancy um, i think as we move as we're moving forward the uh, situation posed by uh, covid and the challenges that we've all faced has um took us into innovation uh, again by default really um, and at any point in um, previously we haven't had um, the desire for innovation and engagement as much as now um, so I, as I say Lancashire I think we are on the on a, on a journey of innovation um, probably not as ahead in innovation as we'd like to be at the moment but we've certainly recognized that that is where we're going and that's what we need to do. Yeah, and I, I think over the, the last six months, you've certainly seen a massive upward trajectory in terms of the number of people being innovative that you, you almost thought were just somebody that would not plod along or teams that would plod along in organisation. 
and suddenly they, they come up with the, the brightest ideas, the best ideas. And it's just giving people that forum. Like you said, then you've got to listen. If people have got a forum to share the, the innovation, it's, it's a massive starting point on things. Um, and speaking purely from a, a Lancaster City Council perspective, innovation was a massive part of our digital strategy that we we just oh last October we we got signed off. It was a, a key underpinning aspect of it that we wanted to be seen as that innovative district and things. And it's certainly one that the whole public sectors should be taking on board with with any sort of strategy, any sort of re-evaluation of how they do things and yeah technology um and digital is almost the you don't want the tail wagging the dog you want the dog wagging the tail and it's it's that sort of an analogy where the the tech is the the very last part of it all um, otherwise you you're trying to put a square in a round hole with systems that don't fit what people want and as we've all seen that fails it's not something that is ever gonna gonna work so start from the people and work your way forward brilliant thank you and so, so i think like we've all had a extremely challenging like like eight months now since kind of covid hit and councils having to make adjustments to kind of how services are delivered how technology is being used and like, it's been fascinating actually as future gov working with councils across the country and and seeing just how quickly um local councils uh you know, public institutions have been able to actually adapt um, quite radically, actually, in terms of the way that they're working. So things like remote working, the use of remote tools, some things actually that almost seem like impossible. These were like bigger changes that were always kind of conceivably going to take much longer in terms of, but actually we saw councils adapt within weeks to working and delivering in different ways. It, like, it'd be great to hear like if you've got some really good examples of kind of how teams have made changes or, or done things over the last six to eight months that that feels innovative in terms of how they've used technology but it's very much focused on supporting the community supporting people keeping services running uh, maybe um so i come back to you first steve and then we'll, we'll go to victoria okay thanks um yeah i think the using lancaster again as a, the example we there we've we've been incredibly innovative and the acceptance of change has been unbelievably good just two two examples there the the the, the speed of which people started working from home accepted they were working from home and that that was almost the the new norm that they were all going to start using microsoft teams telephony um instead of a, a handset in the the office um and just the the way that they all started to to work and speak to each other started to um they were already adopted teams but the the real they've all seen the the real value of of using that and the the other massively um pleasing aspect of of it all if you can have a pleasing aspect is the the way in which the we've adopted um microsoft teams live events for for council meetings whether that's full council, whether it's individual cabinet meetings, whether it's planning meetings, and the, the way that the, the democratic services team have, have really picked that up, um, really grasped it and really got on with the, the councillors, developing them. And there's a massive range of ages from 20 odd to 80 odd. And the, the way that they've really picked it up, really sort of joined, really embraced that change. And I think that is really one of the, the really big things that stood out in the, the last six months. If we'd, we we tried going to a paperless council meetings before that, and there was a bit of reluctance, now it's just like, right, we'll do this. And they're actually coming up with ideas of how they can do things. Or, um, right, for community engagement, we want to use Zoom for that. But for council meetings, official business, we'll use it for, we'll use Teams Live events. So they're actually starting to think a bit more outside the, the box and how they want to satisfy and serve the, the residents a lot better. And how about in central Lancashire, Victoria? Are you seeing some similar kind of patterns and things happening there? Absolutely. Yeah, we, um, over overnight almost, we will, we, um, commence to roll out of um, to enable home working um, that 
in certain pockets of, of LCC that had been resisted previously. Um, I think that some of those challenges keep coming back to people all the time. It's, it's, people are at the heart of everything um, and it had been people resistance to to home working what we're seeing now is the large majority of our workforce who are successfully working from home and um, and also looking at our cultures cultures of trust culture, cultures of enablement um, allowing people to work from home has made, meant um, little to no impact on our services certainly none on our frontline services um, again Steve mentioned a point before about paperless officers, etc. We've seen our our mail and print reduce significantly, um, whereas 95% is now digitised. We'd had um, a, a resistance to uh, to digital mailboxes, for example. Um, people always liked the comfort of the paper in the in the office, and we, we'd have somebody walking around the building taking uh, taking mail to people. Now um, it, it it's it's just a straightforward thing. Mail comes into the office, uh, into the mail room. It's automatically scanned in, and we have uh, digital mailboxes. So I think what COVID has brought, we have to say as Steve said before, some of the positives, there have been some positives, we have to harness those, um, as has been around the reluctance for digital change. Um, it's become an enabler, really, and, uh, and force the issue. Fantastic, thank you. I was going to ask as well, like we mentioned silos before, and, you know, traditionally, like teams not maybe working in a more holistic way, when you think about end-to-end -end services and how we deliver the best possible service and outcome and support people in the right ways in our communities. And we talked a lot about listening to people, like how has that kind of changed over the last eight months? Are we seeing changes in how like those silos are breaking down? Is that a type of innovation that you're starting to see? Um, maybe go back to Victoria first. So, sorry, I'm sorry, Ben, could you just repeat the question? Yeah, so, so broadly thinking, like, I think early on in the introduction, we talked about, about listening to people, taking a more holistic view of services, things like processes, procedures, um, you know, joining up ways of working. Like it might even be in terms of how we're starting to see changes. And I know I've seen this in terms of how councils and are working in a different way with communities, with voluntary sector, with businesses as well. Are you seeing any kind of patterns there or like what's what's starting to happen in Lancashire from your view in terms of because of the last eight months and it might have even okay. been because of the climate emergency before then. Yeah, I think what, what we do have is a lot more cell working. There's a, there's a lot more um, <clears throat> groups of people who are who are joining up with each other who historically wouldn't have done. I think communication has increased. I think um, to some extent communication has um has has increased to the point where it where it's over what we need and I think we need to as as we transition and look at look at what that balance needs to be look at what that healthy balance needs to be people are communicating a lot more there's a lot more cell work a lot more engagement of teams cross cross working happening at the moment and a lot of that is is mostly around um initiatives to support those who are who are most in need um so there's a you know there's the cell work there's a lot more multi-agency work happening as well the multi-agency um side of that's really interesting like do you think the role of the council is changing when we think about like innovation and in kind of how services are being delivered now i don't see that the role of the council is changing i see that um it, it's more engaged um, and, and more receptive. We haven't yet rolled out Microsoft Office um, or Teams. We're, we're just commencing that, that journey now. Uh, we had rolled out Microsoft Teams in island mode, and that was the issue was forced really because um, some of our partner agencies, the courts and Lancashire Constabulary, um, they are facilitate all of their meetings using Microsoft Teams. So we've had, I suppose, a bit of a unique rollout to, um, to Microsoft Office and Teams by going island mode with Teams first. But that was, again, that was forced by, by the situation that we were in. Okay. How about you, Steve? Like, what, what are you seeing in terms of changes to ways of working? And I think you made the original point, actually, about silos and like how you break out of that. Yeah, de definitely. With the the, the initial response um, from from both organisations, of it's it's been very much right. We'll bring everybody together that 
that could have any impact on this will create a, a central um, response team. And those teams have, have stuck together. Communication between them all is, is done via teams. So everybody within the group, even if there's, there was going to be little discussions between person A and person B, it's all done on the, the team's chat now. So it's there. So that, that breadth of knowledge and breadth of communication is there. So like Victoria says, communication has definitely improved. Um, and the stuff that it, it's a lot down to individuals to you, you can duck in and duck out of some of it. Um, so it's there if you want it. Um, if you if you're too busy doing other stuff, then you don't need to. Um, but again, like Victoria said, then teams at Wire we'd never used it before, except for probably within the ICT team, just to so they could see what it was. Now the whole organisation uses it, um, and it was kind of at the initial um, in, on, onset of the the whole pandemic we. We created four food banks for community hub type things, created separate teams for each one, dragged people in from around the organization that had never used it before. And then one down in Fleetwood started to be the, the, the actual um, lead in, in that, saying this is how we want to use it, this is how we should do it. And they started sharing that knowledge. So I think it's it's down to like we said before and i think jonathan's mentioned on the the chat there it's it should be people first people drive the innovation it's not technology because technology can't drive itself uh, much as we all want it to um it makes our jobs a hell of a lot easier um but it's it's it is just down to the the individuals to, to do it but it, breaking down those silos and getting people talking is the the, the best way of, of doing it and delivering and enhancing the services that we we want to offer and victoria going on to that digital mail that's that's exactly what we were talking about doing um the start of the year in in lancaster and I, it's still stuff that we we're still talking about doing at the the moment to to try and help out and try and um improve that flow because everybody's working from home we've got i think we've got one or two offices open very small scale so a post will go in and it'll just sit there on your desk for for months until we're back in the office if we're ever back so it's it's one of those things that we we need to get that solution in place and and just start developing that so people start the the, the requirement is to remove paper the end result is you've got digital mail so that's that's where we all need to get to and I think on the basis of, of communication as well, the question was, has, has communication improved? Um, and I think we have to look at, imp has communication improved or increased? And I think that there's a blend. I think um, some of the communication, well, a lot of communication has increased, um, but in some areas, not necessarily improved. And I think in, in some ways, through some calls and, we're just we're being very reactive uh, we've gone into a home working situation where we've people have um organically and reactively um just had to pick up the phone or pick up a video call um, and i think we're probably heading to a point now where collectively as local authorities or as just even as workers we need to take stock of as to how we're communicating and um you know I think we've, I say we've been reactive, but we probably need to look at um, strategies to how we communicate, to how we communicate effectively and with improvement rather than improve, rather than just increasing communication. Yeah, definitely. And I've, I've certainly started taking advantage of the, the Office 365 suggestions for focus time when it just blocks out your, your calendar because there was a spell of weeks where it was just first thing in the morning to last thing at the end of the day. And it was just video calls like this. And you, you had probably 10, 15 minutes between a meeting in the middle of the day to go and grab a coffee or whatever. And it is just about trying to drive that quality side of communication, making it um, so it, it's short and sharp and it's not something that drags on for an hour when it could be 10, 15 minutes. Because best will in the world, you can be sat on video calls and it's it's brilliant hearing how everybody's cats and dogs are but unless it's actually doing what you actually the purpose of the meeting and driving that 
having an agenda, then that's the only way we're going to really um, help to, to improve that side of things. And a lot of this is down to people never having worked from home before, never having had that, that regimented way of structuring meetings. If you're in the office, you just walk past somebody and you just ask them at the desk. Whereas now people are popping things in the diary for half an hour, an hour, when it would just be a two second um, chat while the kettle boils in the kitchen or whatever. So I think that there is a degree of that, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm mindful of that too. Whereas historically people tend to book out time in half hour or, or hour long slots. I'm starting to put more meetings in, which are just 10 or 15 minutes to set the expectation and having um, that free time as well. Um, it, it, it's a priority for us. There was a phrase um, used um, on, I was on a call last week and people talked about digital fatigue, um, which is true. Um, a lot of us are turning up um, for, to be, I suppose, almost to be, to be on television all day long on these calls. Um, and for some people struggling with it and there's an expectation that people will go onto a video call when they may be more comfortable some days uh, with, with, just, with just a voice call. And I think we need to, um, we need to offer that up. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so, so to go back to our kind of the overall topic, like there's a lot of talk about kind of bringing business thinking and innovation into councils. So maybe like to take actually one of our Q&A questions, so from, from Myra Ellis, uh, actually it'd be great to hear from both of you, like what public sector skills, so in terms of the skills and the people in the public sector in your organisations, like what is there that is perfect for innovation? So what could the public sector be actually driving in terms of innovation back into the the business sector in Lancashire. So shall I come to you first, Victoria? Oh, good question. I mean, I need a minute to think about that, Ben. Yeah, thanks for that, Ben. I would really appreciate <laughs> that. Yeah. Yeah. Like Meyer on the Q&A. Um, but I guess for, for me, that I could talk for a minute while you both think, um, if, if you've got any examples, like it is easy to think that the public sector doesn't innovate. Like we look outside you know, for what's happened, we, ad we adapt kind of to things happening outside. Um, but actually, I think we've seen some great innovation in terms of, you know, especially the way digital is used to deliver services, um, to do that in a very, you know, cost optimal way as well. So often to make services sustainable to, you know, thousands of people, but actually to, to make sure that, you know, services are available. Uh, all day, every day that people can access things that are actually, you know, really important dependencies in their life when it's getting support for, you know, the places they live, their, their health care, you know, the, the fundamental things that kind of local government is involved with, you know, helping to support people with. Um, but I, I think like there's fantastic examples of kind of how local government, as well as central government health has adopted things like agile delivery using like more design led processes in terms of, um, you know, much more kind of people centered delivery. So going back to kind of the original kind of gov.uk, you know, digital transformation of kind of one platform for information for, for government in the UK through to like great examples I've seen of councils rebuilding new platforms in terms of information and guidance, but also delivering services through, through those channels. So people being able to access services online, being able to self-serve more. Um, also how those can link into kind of local infrastructure. So I think even going back to my previous kind of question, like seen lots of councils. So like in Greater Manchester is a good example, places like Trafford where they've used community hubs really effectively. So still using physical infrastructure um, to bring services together in one place. So again, kind of changing role of the council with voluntary and community sector but even things like uh, how agile has been kind of adopted i think in kind of service delivery in councils is a great example but uh, do either of you want to to share anything in relation to that when you think of any examples i think there's an opportunity for us to to work rather than um examples ben i think there's opportunities for us to work more closely with trade um I, don't think that that's happened as much as it could have done previously um, but I think certainly that there's, there's the opportunity there I think what we need to 
what we need to do is focus on a more collaborative approach and bringing out um, best skills um, from, biz from private enterprise with, uh, with local authority. And I think local authority has got a lot to learn from that too, from an innovation perspective. We um, tend, you know, innovation within local authorities has been pro probably more stifled than it is in, in the mm. private sector. And I think this is an opportunity for us to harness that through, um, through engagement. Yeah, um, I think following on from that, in, within Lancaster, we, about four months ago, we, we launched a, a digital board and it was the, the whole purpose and modus operandi of that was bringing together public sector, private sector, um, anybody that was, was really interested in, in joining it. And we, we've got a, a good group there of, of businesses, individuals that are there to, to look at the challenges of the, the district, how we can innovate. And we've got um, two of the, the key work streams of, around that are social and digital inclusion for the, the district, but also we've got a, a, a work stream of pure innovation. And I noticed uh, Rick Holland's on the, the, the webinar today, and he, he actually presented to, to the digital board last week about Innovate UK and, and what they can bring to, to innovation and things. So we, as a as a local authority, as a as a council, we 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 took that on board. We realised that we don't know everything. We're never going to solve every issue in the world. Um, that that was one of the the key learnings for for me very early on. That you need to embrace everybody. Forget public private sector. You're all in it together. That's a some political party is going to coin that one as a phrase, aren't we? Um, so yeah, it, everybody forget whether it's public, private sector, you've all got to solve these challenges together. And yes, somebody will monetize it in the end, but let's all do it together. Let's all drive that, that desire, that innovation and things and work together on it. So you mentioned your, um, you mentioned like some of the things you've been doing. Like one of my questions today was actually like, how do we make sure in Lancashire that any innovation and that that is going to be a combination of people working together, private, public sector, uh, voluntary sector. But how do we make sure that it does benefit anybody, everyone? So everyone living in Lancashire benefits, especially as we look at, you know, the need to create opportunities around jobs, economic growth now as we come, you know, come, come through COVID in some shape. Um, how do we make sure that, you know, new services, whether invested in technology, that, that benefits everybody as well? Um, like Victoria, did you, have you got any other examples of kind of what you're doing in central Lancashire kind of building on what Steve just shared? I think it, it's more around um, how we tune in to, to what's happening and what the challenges are and then how we validate. Um, so it, it, it's all well and good coming up with um, digital or innovative um, ideas, but they need to be cross-referenced back to what the challenges are. So we need some very tangible examples. We're um, looking at what our digital inclusion strategy is currently in Lancashire, um, and that is that, that's a big challenge for everybody. There are um, people often think of digital exclusion just being in the in the hard to reach areas. It's more than that. It's it's the economic factor. It's um, young people at home unable to have access to the internet for schoolwork, um, access to devices for people who may be isolated. Um, so we're on we're, we're pulling together our um, digital inclusion strategy now. I've been working with the ICS um, for, for South Ribble and with the NHS on that and looking at how we can work collaboratively to have um, to have a stronger offering. And there's, I know um, Kerry Harrison's been doing a lot of work around um, obtaining uh, devices. What we need to do is now go to the next level and look at all of those who are digitally excluded, um, but not also digitally excluded, those who will, who will never engage. We can't miss those people out too. Yeah, and I think the, there is a perception of um, everybody um, in in social housing or, or that side of things that they're all going to have top of the range sky packages and top of the range mobile phones and the, the actual percentage that does is incredibly low 
So it's those, it's that sort of area that, that we're looking at for the, the digitally excluded and, and trying to include the, the, the people in those sort of areas to, to try and help them serve themselves. And we, we, we're going to be putting masses of fibre and improving connectivity in the ground. But any sort of social housing that, that we control the, the housing stock for, we're going to be putting free Wi-Fi in there. We're going to be putting um, uh, an area where there's a PC in there that people can just go ahead and, and use. And those sort of things are, are things that I don't think public sector would have would have looked at three, four years ago. And now just having people just saying, right, okay, blank piece of paper, what do you want? And people are saying, well, why can't we do this? And when people are saying, why can't we? And nobody has a valid reason. That's That for me is a very good reason to go ahead and do it. If all it is, is people think, well, we wouldn't have been able to do that. Well, ask, challenge, and then we can actually work and develop that as opposed to just accepting, going back to one of my very early points, that don't accept the, the norm, challenge. And if you challenge, you will innovate. I think maybe as a follow-up question, like it sounds like some fantastic kind of initiatives happening. Um, I guess the challenge, and actually another question from Maya, and I'll, I'll come back to the other questions in the Q&A in a second as well. Uh, just thinking about the diversity of the needs that we're trying to meet in society when we think of an area like like even just Lancashire, uh, Lancaster within kind of Lancashire as, a, as an area. How do you go about understanding really kind of like building that understanding of what people need in society to make sure that we're delivering the right solutions? It, it really does feel to me that there's an issue of like innovation as a process that we've got to get right in terms of you know, how we work and how we understand people's needs because you, know, you can give people laptops but they might not have wi-fi um and there's still other barriers you know and how, how do you go about understanding that firsthand and what processes are you putting in place steve to to make that work and make sure that we're investing in all this great tech but is it the right thing in the right place will it be used in the right ways we're, we're very much led by our services um within the the organization um we we've we've got our internal services that, that understand to a degree, but they also embrace a, a lot of the, the third sector organisations. We've got um, Claire Louise Chapman as a, a member of our digital board, who's bringing a lot of that, that knowledge to the, to the digital board and, and sharing it. So I, I think it, it is just a, a, a question of, of sharing that um, and bringing together all of the, the, the relevant people. It's not something any one person can, can solve or one service within a, an organization. It is, as we've said on multiple things, it, it is that collaborative approach and things. And how about in Central Lanx, Victoria? How's that working in terms of how you're starting to, you know, introduce kind of more radical solutions like this investment in kind of the community? How are you making sure that you're delivering the right things? It's, it's just exactly what Steve just said. It's, it's being led by the service. It's being led by the subject matter experts. Um, you know, we have to have the subject matter experts and the services at the heart of, of each um, digital initiative or innovative project. Um, it's, it's vital because digital, we're, we're just the enablers um, and it needs to be service driven. Yeah, and the, the other key link that we've we've got as well is we do a lot of work with Lancaster University and they their their research funding their research knowledge is absolutely brilliant so we've we've lent on them a lot um, and just before the the pandemic we we had some funding there to to look at what we were classing as as fuel poverty where we knew there was a lot of residents that the the energy bills and energy consumption was was sky high but we didn't understand why so part of that study was to to look at um energy leakage energy um better suggestions for how people could use it if people were leaving the front door wide open or slightly ajar and if the energy was leaking out the, the roof and all that sort of stuff so it helped it would have helped us to target preventative maintenance but also then 
have that knock-on effect of driving down energy energy costs for for our residents and things so the, there is that and that was a, a research project that was being led by the the university and working closely with them so for for me yeah it's it's public sector it's private sector and it's the educational sector they're they're the ones that for want of a better expression, spend all the time in the labs, throwing ideas around, making things blow up, testing things. And they're the ones that will come up with these really different ideas. When they set a challenge, they will go away and come up with 20 different ideas. 19 will be not the best, but this one idea will be so groundbreaking, it'd be untrue. So I think it is dragging everybody to, together. Fantastic. Well, I guess the thing I would add from kind of my experience of like working across the public sector as well is that we there's only so much we can we can learn before we actually commit to doing something when we're working with communities and trying to meet people's needs in the right way. And not, I very much think of it as a as design process and design really being a way of like learning by doing. So actually, what can we prototype? What changes can we make to a service? What can we introduce in terms of um, technology kind of opportunities into people's lives but then how do we quickly um, and it, iteratively respond to that so how do we actually learn through evaluating what's happening so uh, designing new service models but actually seeing how they work and being kind of set up in a way that allows us to quickly make changes and adapt to, to the kind of constant change that's happening in people's lives as well um, so, like sorry, quite often, do you do you think the public sector is a bit risk averse to to trying things like that and innovating, or do you think they they're really starting to to grasp it now and change? So I, I think there's some great examples kind of emerging, and like there's good examples of kind of where councils in in different service areas are starting to innovate in that way. But I think like design as a process can be a way of like reducing that risk. So like we we did a lot with kind of like we a lot of what we're doing is actually not knowing what the right solution is until actually it comes into contact with the real world because the reality of people's lives and their needs is, is messy and um, different kind of extremes of kind of circumstances, you know, create challenges. And that's why our service teams, our frontline teams are so skilled and so necessary to kind of being able to meet people's needs and how you give them the right tools and technologies to, and the adaptability within that is kind of, determines the success of that i think but i think introducing things like agile ways of le learn kind of working learning you know by doing like prototyping for me is the kind of key part of that so how you know if it's about introducing laptops and wi-fi like what is the quickest cheapest way that we can test some of those assumptions we're making when we're starting to introduce tools and technologies into a community space or into social housing um, how can we make sure that we reduce the risk of essentially like investing in the wrong technologies or, you know, giving the, putting in the wrong solutions at the wrong kind of point. And quite often it's about really understanding the end to end journey that somebody's going through when they have a situation in their lives and the role that the council plays in that as well. Um, but yeah, I think across lots of councils, there's great examples of starting to take a different approach to managing risk through actually it is more agile ways of working. So saying like, what is the smallest thing we can do to incrementally test some of the assumptions that we're making? Uh, like, how do we make this into a hypothesis when we're saying it's a, it's a new business model? It's a, it's a new set of kind of you know it's a new set of things that we're we're doing in terms of delivering these you know whether it's delivering you know adult services children's services housing services um but prototyping doesn't just have to be like digital tools like we've seen really interesting work in the last like last year where we've seen kind of housing teams prototype kind of new ways of working so almost setting up like a sub team where they're working in different ways with other council teams to break down silos and again, you can take a very hypothesis kind of led approach to that and it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Um, you could even prototype technology in a very kind of cheap, accessible way without getting into large IT procurement uh, to make sure, again, you know, we're, we're help, really what we're wanting to do is inform our decision making, whether it's build or buy when it comes to IT, with as much evidence as possible that we can build through doing good use of research, good discovery, uh, going through some sort of prototyping process where we work with the people that are actually going to experience the service. But how do you feel about that, Steve? Because you're at the kind of front line of like delivering IT. Like, do you find that kind of tension with it, like 
like the sector being very risk averse in terms of what you can do? I, to, to an extent, I think sometimes it is because every setting up proof of concept and just trying something um, when you don't have a very specific defined project is a lot more challenging public sector than private sector. Manufacturing background, yeah, if we wanted to try something, we'd just go ahead and do it. We, it'd just be like, yeah, go on, let's, let's spend 20, 30, 40 grand on something. Public sector now, I think if, if we wanted to spend 20 grand doing a proof of concept, it would be very difficult because of the, the sign off loops, the, um, the, the validation that actually we can't just spend 20 grand of public money without having something tangible on the, the end of it. So I think to a degree, there's um, an element of being risk averse, but if you do the, the upfront work, like you say, then you can almost get to the point where it is a proof of concept and it is something new and challenging but you've also got a weight of evidence behind to, to kind of give that sort of 75 percent justification for doing it as opposed to the 100 percent business need um so i think that there is definitely an, an element of risk averse but it's it's knowing what levers to, to pull and what buttons to press to, to actually do it so um moving to teams telephony was was one of those for us that um, we we knew it was going to be an expensive thing potentially, but we got to a point where um, we'd done it as part of an agile working project that we said, right, okay, this is going to be a big project potentially. So let's throw all of our eggs in one basket and move to this. And then as soon as you get that ground sort of opinion, you get to that 75% of people saying, yeah, this is brilliant. And then by that point, you can just go, right, I'm going to spend X amount doing it elsewhere. So I think, yeah, you, you've kind of got to to know buttons to press and levers to pull on that. And I think as well to uh, to mitigate the risk, it's around um, having um, those projects front loaded with the right analysis, um, the right business analysis, understanding um, what the challenge is and how the uh, potential solution matches to the challenge and the, the tangible um, outputs from that. We mentioned before around engagement, absolutely vital that we engage with the frontline services and understand what the impact of our innovation is. But to answer your question, yes, I do think in general, public sector is generally risk averse. Um, there are a number of, of reasons for that. Uh, Lancashire uh, have um, set out on our improvement journey. Um, we've got an organisational change directorate in place. Um, and I think that's been something that's been recognised and identified and um, we, we have plans to improve. Brilliant. Yeah. And like, in a way, we could have another hour's conversation, I think, just about like how to how to think about kind of moving past that risk aversion, especially when we're talking about the need for more radical models of how government works at a local level. Uh, we had a question from Jonathan Moss um, a while back in the chat, which I think would be good to come back to, which is really about, and we've talked about like, lots of the, the fantastic things you're doing with your teams and in your councils at the moment, but what kind of investment are you making in your staff as, as councils at the moment in terms of the types of things we've talked about, in terms of new ways of working? Like, what kind of investment is there to you know, create the right kind of strategic thinking those communication skills you've talked about victoria and the kind of creative leadership that that maybe we need to to move past that like we talked about mindsets right at the start as well so we talk about like risk is a mindset i think as well in terms of how you design and how you you know develop the right processes for enabling service areas um maybe should we start with you victoria yeah, so we've um, we, so we've um, set up our organisational change directorate, uh, which has you know looked at the council, looked at where we need to improve, and um, be beginning to identify how we need to change as as a local authority. Um, a lot of that isn't just about the tech; it's it's around it's around the vision, it's around the people. Um, there will be a point in uh, change agents as well, which will look at not only um, how we need to adapt from, um, from a digital 
perspective or with innovation, but how uh, people and processes can can change. How about you, Steve, at uh, Lancaster? Yeah, I think following on from that, there, there isn't necessarily, a, a, from a, an ICT perspective, a, a monetary investment, but the, there is a, a freedom for people to express and come up with ideas. And um, we will review those and, and look at those. And it's sometimes just saying to people, this, this is the, the objective. This is the, the business process that we want to improve or whatever. And just putting the, the, the power in the, the individual or the, the, the people to, to actually go away and come up with ideas. I think culturally, um, from a, a, a Lancaster and a, a Wyatt perspective, that's, that's been something that hasn't necessarily been there before in the, the ICT side of things. I think it's something where it's been, it's kind of, right, this is the idea from the, the, the head honcho and this is how you do it, crack on. I'm completely not like that. I, I, I would rather the, the teams come up with the idea and I want them to, to actually do the, that and reevaluate things. I, I'll, I'll speak to the organisation, the, the business, and, and find out the a, a business process or a, the, the objective. And it's, it's down to the, the guys to, to come up with this solution. I, I hate coming up with the solutions like that. I, I'm really not there for that. That's, that's where I, I've got 30 odd people sat there doing um, different innovative ideas, different ways of, of working. And if you give the same objective to 10 different people, you'd probably get 10 different ways of doing it. And that's exactly the sort of, environment and culture that I want within my teams that I want them to have the ability to think and go away and do it themselves and with a, a relative degree of going back to what you said before Ben about that that trial and error behind the scenes as part of a, a bigger project that sometimes you do have the ability to to do that so I think for for me it's it's giving people the the, the freedom and the time to to, to do it yeah, it's fostering um, an environment whereby people feel comfortable to put forward um, their ideas. Uh, historically, I think within local authorities are very much uh, process driven and uh, people have a process and they adhere to it and don't, don't deviate. So we need to foster that culture whereby people feel comfortable to put their ideas forward and uh, people feel comfortable to get it wrong as well because uh, a lot of the time people don't like to put things forward for fear of not saying the right thing um, or something which may not be fully thought through. But we really need to get into that culture where we, we foster ideas, um, you know, brainstorming where it might, might just be a thought, but it can lead to something uh, with, with more analysis and more working through that could be a very tangible um, output for the local authority by way of project. I, I, I see myself more in those such, sort of situations as the facilitator, as a person writing on the, the whiteboard yeah. and documenting what everybody else is saying and, and doing it that way, as opposed to saying to people, this is how you're going to do it. I, I, I know I don't know everything. I, I know a very small percentage of what my guys need to know and what they actually do know. So I would quite happily just be the, that one that asks the questions um, and helps them um clarify and document what's there and things and then come to that that wider agreement fantastic um as as these things always do it's gone really really quickly this hour and fantastic conversation i wonder just to finish it'd be great like just to give you both um a final minute really just to reflect on, on anything you, you'd want to kind of highlight from the conversation but like Really fantastic to hear about the work going on at Central Lancashire and also at Lancaster and with your team, Steve. Uh, but yeah, like anything that people can do. So we've got people dialed in today from, from the wider community, from business, anything that people can get involved with or any kind of help that you're looking for with your work that you want to highlight. But I'll, I'll give the floor over to you just to finish. Um, Steve, do you want to go first? Okay, I, th I think for me, the, the big thing is if people want to be involved and want to, to find out about the, the digital strategy of Lancaster, 
go to the lancaster.gov.uk uh, forward slash digital have a look on there it's a it's a new site that we we set up we're using that as the the way of communicating with the, the wider district um, and if people want to be part of the the board or we we've had a number of guest speakers to help with work streams and and that side of things send send me an email i'm sure dan can can publicize it at the the end um and definitely be in touch there but as we said people collaboration and listen i think are the the three things for me fantastic thanks steve over to you victoria yeah it's, it's around making sure that we are um having the, the services at, at the focus of everything that we do that we are solution led and that we don't overuse the word innovation as a as a mechanism to go and do something because it, it might look powerful or quirky or out there or whatever it is it's around making sure that that innovation um leads to very tangible outputs which are service-led Fantastic. Um, yeah, and I think we'll, so what we'll do is we'll wrap up the conversation there. Thank you so much for your Q&A questions as well. There's been some really good um, comments on the chat, just echoing some of the, the key themes, uh, but I'll hand back over to Dan there. Thanks very much, Ben. And uh, thank you to Victoria and Steve for uh, a fantastic uh, conversation there. Um, as Steve mentioned, if you would like to, um, follow up with any questions if you email through to support at lancashireinnovationfestival.co.uk we will uh, forward your questions on uh, a huge thank you to all the panel uh, please again check the uh, lancashireinnovationfestival.co.uk website for some more absolutely fantastic talks coming up later on today we'll be talking about how do we encourage the next generation of innovators until then thanks very much for all of you and we'll finish there thank you including some of the county's innovation experts from higher education, health, clean technologies, and many more. You can see the full schedule and register online for free at lancashireinnovationfestival.co.uk. So join us for a month of inspiration, collaboration, and discovery around innovation. This October, you're invited to explore how you can harness innovation, consider new viewpoints and fresh ideas, and explore how learning, technology, and innovation can come together. This brand new festival will champion some of Lancashire's latest innovations across 25 events, hosted by more than 50 speakers, including some of the county's innovation experts from higher education, health, clean technologies, and many more. You can see the full schedule and register online for free. Uh, everybody's out now, so if you want to turn your screens back on. <laughs>